I really have to start with a confession, which is that I never imagined I would write about boys. It was totally not on my to-do list. And I have, as I just said, I have spent over 25 years chronicling girls' lives in a changing world. But as I went around the country after publishing Girls and Sex, which was about the contradictions that young women still face in their intimate lives, everywhere I went, parents, girls, boys themselves said, what about the boys? When are you gonna write about the boys? And I will tell you that one of the places that, were, that I went where that message was loud and clear was Seattle Town Hall. So this book is in part a result of this community, um, which is pretty cool. And I also just wanna put out there that, you know, I'm thinking about what I wanna do next, so if you've got some more ideas. <laughs> I'm ready. Um, anyway, so y'all said that, and I said, uh-uh. Um, I resisted. I, I said, that's really somebody else's job. You know, it's not mine. Um, and my first reason was that it seemed to me that it was girls' lives that had really been transformed by the earthquake of feminism. And it was their parents who had been the ones asking for further change. The expectations of boys had altered some, but not nearly as much. So I really wasn't sure about what there would be to say. And I also wasn't sure, to be, fit, to be honest, that um, boys would talk. Because unlike teen girls, not so much a reputation for chattiness. And I really worried that I would have entire transcripts that consisted of, uh-huh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> Plus, you know, I look like their mom. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the truth was nobody was talking to boys and nobody was really listening to them to see what they were thinking about sex and intimacy and masculinity and gender dynamics in a changing world. So I began to do a few preliminary interviews and while I was kind of gathering string and thinking about this, a new earthquake happened and the Me Too re revelations broke. And suddenly the pervasiveness and the sheer magnitude of sexual misconduct across every sector of society by men young and old became glaringly and disturbingly obvious. Masculinity was de declared to be broken. What was that? Um, and toxic. And, um, and, and, the parents of boys that I had met who when I would talk about my work uh, with girls used to say, you know, I'm kind of glad I have a boy. They stopped saying that because they realized that their job was actually harder. They had to raise good men. So Me Too created this imperative to reduce sexual violence, but I also felt it created this positive opportunity to maybe for the first time engage young men in these conversations about sex and intimacy because, you know, We've got to know what's in their heads in order to help them make the best choices. So I began talking to boys. And I talked to guys, of about 100 of them across the country, ages 16 to 22. And for parity's sake, they're in a similar demographic to the girls I talked to in Girls and Sex, which meant they were college-bound high schoolers or already in college. Um, but beyond that, I cast my net pretty broadly. So they were of different ethnicities, religions, came from different parts of the country, from big cities and small towns. Sorry, this light keeps going on and off on me. There we go. Um, they were from big cities and small towns. They were different sexual orientations, um, different gender identities. And um, they all, I also delved really deeply into the uh, existing research on boys, sex, and masculinity, and that kind of undergirds the book. But to me, the real um, meat of the book was the voices of these boys. And the biggest surprise to me in doing the work, and maybe more than any particular conclusion that comes out of it, was that they were so eager to talk. And they were so insightful about narrating their experience. If anything, they were more forthcoming than the girls had been, especially about the things that boys aren't supposed to want to talk about, which is their feelings. And at first I was really taken aback by that, but then I realized how really rarely boys are given permission and opportunity to explore their interior lives. So as a writer and as a thinker, I'm interested in exploring the contradictions in the way that we socialize our kids around gender 
And the ways that we layer the new expectations that we have of them, even progressive and positive new expectations, over old ideas without necessarily examining or discarding those old ideas. So with boys, of course, there have been tremendous changes, particularly in the public realm. Boys see young women as you know, equal to them in the classroom, deserving of their place in leadership, deserving of professional opportunities, and deserving of their places on the playing field. Um, they're more likely to have female friends than they used to be, and certainly more likely to have gay male friends. Yet, when I would ask those same boys to describe to me the ideal guy, I always did that as kind of a lightning round with the boys, it sounded like they were channeling 1955. They would say dominance, aggression, or actually this weird combination of aggressive and chill, which I never could quite get. Um, <laughs> athleticism, sexual conquest, and the big one, emotional suppression, stoicism. It was all part of what psychologist William Pollock has called the boy code which positions masculinity as in opposition to and sometimes adversarial toward femininity or anything that may smack of the feminine in themselves, in other boys, in girls. And that is tenuous and ever-shifting ground that boys must continually police. So if I have to do a soundbite about these books side by side, what I say is that I feel like the girl book was about how girls were systematically disconnected from their bodies and their body's responses. And with the boy, the book is very much about how they were systematically disconnected from their hearts. And how that not only affects them, but by playing into their approach to sex and relationships, affects their intimate partners as well. In my conversations with boys, they, were they routinely confided that they felt denied the full spectrum of human emotions by their male peers, by their girlfriends, by the media, by coaches, by their parents. 60% of guys in one um, international study said that, um, hmm. that, that they felt that their parents were the source of restrictive gender norms, and particularly their fathers. And I was really interested in how guys talked about their dads because, you know, yeah, a few of the boys would say things like, my dad would tell me, you know, suck it up, don't be a little bitch, you know, man up, all that kind of thing. But more guys would say things like uh, a young man um, who was a, uh, in college said to me, my dad wasn't sexist, he wasn't homophobic, he wasn't, you know, I didn't learn that toxic masculinity from him. But I did learn the stunted side of masculinity. He never expressed emotion. He was more of a sigh and walk away kind of a guy than the kind of guy who would talk to you about what was going on. Um, another guy said to me that he felt that all guys were allowed was happiness and anger. And you know, he wasn't that far from wrong. From the get-go, infant boys grow up in an impoverished emotional environment compared to girls. So there's a classic study where adults are shown videos of infants being startled by a jack-in-the-box. And if they're told before they see the video that the infant is male, whether or not that is in fact the case, they're more likely to say that the baby's response is anger as opposed to fear or surprise. Similarly, mothers of infants talk with more emotional range to their daughters than their sons. And again, with boys, the emotion that is most focused on is anger. So from the time they're little, boys can learn that this whole bucket of emotions having to do with sadness, grief, anxiety, confusion, frustration, heartbreak, betrayal, all gets funneled into that one emotion, anger. And the risk then is that they turn that anger against others or against themselves. Boys who most rigidly adhere to those man box, so-called man box norms, are more prone to bullying, sexual harassment, and assault, to physical or verbal violence against others. They're also more likely themselves to be the victims of violence and bullying. They're mo more prone to binge drinking, risky sexual behavior, getting into car accidents, and they're less happy than other guys with higher rates of depression and fewer friends in whom they can confide. So the rewards they get for clinging to those norms, and there are rewards to be sure for doing that, come at a tremendous cost. 
Even the more egalitarian boys that I talked to would talk to me about how they felt that they had learned to put up a wall between the world and their real feelings. And that usually had happened sometime in middle school or high school. And they would say things to me like, I trained myself not to feel, or you learn to confide in no one. So one of the boys that I spoke with, Rob, was telling me about a breakup with his high school girlfriend who had cheated on him during their first semester of college. So what he told me was, yeah, she did that, so snapped his fingers. I forgot about her, but not really. He couldn't focus on his schoolwork. He'd stopped taking joy in his day-to-day -day activities. He didn't want to go out anymore. The truth was, he was depressed, although he didn't call it that. And the person he would normally have talked to about this was his girlfriend. But, of course, she was the source of his pain. He even went to a session with a counselor, but he said it was too weird to talk about feelings, so he didn't go back. He thought he should just be able to handle it, that anything else could be weak, would be seen as weak. Finally, he went home for Thanksgiving, and he had what he referred to as a breakdown in front of his mother, who immediately said, spill it. And he did. And, you know, that helped. But it also got me thinking. When boys confide, it is usually to a girlfriend or a female friend or their mothers. And I think it can feel really sweet as a mom when your boy, you know, shows that vulnerability to you and, and shares like that. But I think we also have to be really careful because when we process boys' emotions for them rather than helping them learn to name and process them themselves, we reinforce that idea that women are there to do men's emotional labor. And, you know, that can feel okay when it's your son. I think a lot of women in the room tonight would probably know feels a lot less okay when it's in your adult relationships. And unfortunately, that can leave boys ill-prepared for their own intimate relationships. And truly, what I feel is at the very heart of this book, even more than anything that's about sex itself, is boys struggling with that relationship to vulnerability, with the taboo against it, with the denial of it, with capitulation to it, with embracing it. Emotional vulnerability is fundamental to our humanity. But beyond that, Brene Brown calls it the secret sauce that holds relationships together. So when we disconnect boys from their own vulnerability, we reduce or deny their capacity to have the very kinds of intimate relationships that we want them to be able to have as adults. And again, that hurts them, and it radiates outward to potentially hurt their romantic partners. That learned disconnection is reinforced by a culture of conquest that still encourages boys to see sex as a form of status seeking and bragging about their ex exploits, especially about their domination and control of girls' bodies, as a way to bond as sexual, heterosexual guys. I mean, when you think about that so-called locker room talk that has been so much in the public eye lately, how do guys talk, right? They hammer, they pound, they bang, they nail, they pipe, they hit that, they tap that, they destroy her, they rip her up. You know, it's like they have visited a construction site, not like they've engaged in an act of intimacy. But it's not like the guys that I met were all blank slates who were going, yeah, dude, that's how I want to talk. You know, a lot of them were really struggling with this. And so one day I talked to this boy, Cole, who had um, told me about how he and a friend had challenged an older boy on their crew team who was in the locker room saying something despicable about girls, a, a particular girl. And they immediately were targeted and mocked. So the next time somebody said something, Cole said, he didn't say anything, but his friend did. And he said he watched as his friend continued to do this, and he said, the more he stepped up and the more I stepped back, the less it seemed like other guys liked him and the less they listened to him, and he lost all his social capital. And I was sitting there with just buckets of it left, but I wasn't spending any of it. And he was actually about to go into the military, and he said, I don't know what I'm going to do because I don't want to have to choose between my dignity and these guys that I'm going to serve with. But how do I make it so that I don't have to choose? And I thought about Cole and his dilemma and that silence a lot. Psychologist Michael Thompson says that silence in the face of cruelty and misogyny is how boys learn to become men. 
So learning about masculinity then becomes not only what boys do say, but what about they, what they can't or don't or won't say, even when they wish they could. I'm always interested, I'm an English major. Any English majors in the house? You know, English majors are like totally in, uh, obsessed with language. And another thing that I thought a lot about when I was writing this book was how, po how guys police the masculine through, let's just say for the sake of comfort in the room, homophobic slurs. Again, on one hand, there'd been some real interesting transition around that, especially older, the older guys I talked to tended not to use those words as frequently anymore. Um, and more interesting was that straight boys kind of across the board, they would say, they had gay friends, and they'd say, oh, I would never use those words to a gay person. Like, somehow that made it okay. Um, but that seemed really weird until you realized that those words, especially the F word, um, is less about sexual orientation than about a referendum on masculinity. Homophobic slurs really draw the lines of the man box. And they felt very much to me like the way that we talk about um, slut for girls. And like slut, the definition of those words, particularly the F word, is fluid and elusive. You can really be called that for any reason, you know, for tripping in the hallway or for dropping your pencil. And that only intensifies its power. It keeps guys perpetually vigilant, although it's not always clear against what. And it, sh um, it shuts down any challenge to that boy code. So C.J. Pasco, who's a um, sociologist in uh, Oregon, did a survey of 1,000 tweets that used the hashtag no homo. And what she found was that, yeah, it's a homophobic slur. Yeah, it's a joke. But in a deeper way, guys were using it to, um, as a deflective shield to express just kind of basic human emotion. So she would see things like, I miss you, dude. We should get together more often. No homo. Um, so it was a way to just express affection and connection that boys felt they weren't really allowed. I also became obsessed with how boys use the word hilarious. Hilarious is always a good default position. It's a safe haven that you can turn to when something is inappropriate or confusing or depressing or unnerving or horrifying or when it defies your ethics. Hilarious guarantees that you won't be marginalized or targeted. But here's the thing. Research into why we find something that violates our morals to be funny shows that in order for that to happen, we have to simultaneously believe that the thing in, that we're laughing about is offensive and that the subject of that laughter, that what we're doing is harmless. So if you take like a dead baby joke, if I just told you a dead baby joke, you might think it was funny. But if first I told you about how um, the baby was born and the parents uh, realized it was sick and how they had to grieve and the baby's death and the horribleness of the funeral, and then I told you a dead baby joke, you really wouldn't think that was appropriate. So um, when boys talk about something that's hilarious, that degrades or defiles a woman, then that becomes another way to um, subvert compassion. It becomes another way that boys' heads and boys' hearts are severed. And I became really interested in how in the really high-profile um, headline-grabbing assault cases among high school boys, they tended to use hilarious as what they thought was going on when they assaulted. In Steubenville, um, in the assaults of um, Daisy Coleman and Annie Pot, Audrey Pot, that, those, that's what the boys said. They thought they were just being funny, that they were just being hilarious. So that's really not harmless at all. And hilarious is especially troubling when it's used by bystanders. Because if something is hilarious, then you don't have to step in, and it's no problem. Most of the guys that I met had never had discussions about any of this with a parent. They'd also never had much conversation about sex or intimacy. Parents were generally still telling boys a couple of things. Don't get a girl pregnant, don't get a disease. Now they were adding a third thing, respect women. But guys would say to me, what exactly is that supposed to mean? You know, don't s hold somebody down and rape her. Don't use the word bitch or pussy when you're alone with your guys. Don't have casual sex, or if you do, make sure your partner has an orgasm before you do. As one guy said to me, 
It's kind of like telling somebody not to run over any little old ladies and then handing them the car keys. I mean, of course you think you're not going to run over any little old ladies, but you still don't know how to drive. And absent that substantive conversation with parents or teachers, pornography has become the de facto sex educator. Now, I never asked boys that I interviewed whether they watched porn. That would have shot my credibility to hell. I always asked when they first saw it on purpose. And usually that was the, around the time that they went through puberty. So from the get-go, they had been learning to link their cycle of desire, arousal, and release to those videos. Now I want to make some things clear in framing this conversation. Curiosity about sex, normal. Masturbation, yay. Everybody should be doing it, crucial for boys and for girls. And we could debate ideas about whether there's a, such a thing as ethical porn or queer porn or feminist porn, but it's kind of beside the point because even if you believe those things, those things are all behind a paywall anyway. What has really changed was, yes, the internet, yes, the smartphone, but also in 2007, Pornhub went online and it dropped the paywall which meant that suddenly anything that you can imagine, and frankly, a whole lot of things that nobody particularly wants to imagine, um, are right at your fingertips. And that most easily accessible porn that kids see presents a distorted idea about sex as transactional, commodified, disconnected. It shows sex as something men do to rather than with women. It shows female pleasure as a performance for men it eroticizes inequality and degradation. And even in a lot of the vanilla clips, the stuff that they do really wouldn't feel that good to most people. Research out of Indiana University of um, parents and their same-sex teens, so fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, uh, shows that um, teenagers watch more porn and harder core porn than their same-sex parents. So um, boys were uh, three times more likely to have viewed extreme content such as rape, gang bangs, and facial abuse. And the difference between girls and their moms was even higher. So I know that most of you parents out there would rather poke yourself in the eye with a fork than talk to your child about porn. But the truth is we don't um, have the luxury of silence anymore. We have to talk to kids about what's real and what's not real and what's missing. Because our kids are absorbing those messages and they're bringing them along with its behaviors into the bedroom. So boys would often say to me though, well I know the difference between fantasy and reality. Mm -hmm. And again, what did that really mean exactly? Especially with no actual personal experience. And it's important to recognize that all media, not just porn, influences our feelings, beliefs, and behaviors even when we think that it doesn't. You know, that's why the Russians used media to undermine our democracy, because it works that way. Um, so guys who consume porn regularly are actually more likely, I'm sorry, I keep playing with this light, I just have to keep playing with it, um, are actually more likely to um, believe that its images are real than other guys and to want to enact its uh, more aggressive behaviors in the bedroom. Regular porn users have also been shown to be less satisfied than other guys in their partnered experience, as well as um, less satisfied with their own performance and less satisfied with their partner's bodies. So I think that that's helpful for boys to know. Um, Emily Nagoski also talks about a, uh, who writes about the science of desire, also talks about a um, mechanism in our brain that makes something that is, well, Okay, I want you guys um, not to think of a polar bear. Okay, do not think about polar bears. Whatever you do, I want you to step, like, wait, you're all, you weren't thinking about polar bears, right? Now you're all thinking about polar bears. Because embedded in that idea of stop thinking about polar bears is think about polar bears. And embedded in the idea that you shouldn't think about sex when something is degrading or upsetting to you is think about sex when this thing is degrading or upsetting to you. And that can actually turbocharge that tension, um, arousal, making something that is objectionable to you more exciting than something that's overtly desired. 
And I think that knowing that too can help boys understand what they're seeing and the kind of physiology of how they're reacting and maybe help them start to think about the difference between something that is um, super arousing and something that's actually pleasurable or desired or wanted. I just wanna say one more thing about the impact of porn and it's something that a high school senior said to me and it really stuck with me. It was kind of a throwaway when he said it. He said, I feel like porn affects your ability to be innocent in a sexual relationship. And this whole idea of exploring sex without any preconceived notions of what it is, that process has just been fucked for our generation by porn. So I think to me that was kind of the, you know, that really summed it up and was kind of the most poignant comment of all. But the truth is, you could block every triple X site on the internet and good luck with that. Um, and kids are still going to be exposed to mainstream media. And there too, they get a steady diet of male sexual entitlement and female sexual availability. And the truth is that exposure to any sexual content in media, whether it's TV, YouTube, movies, video games, mu music videos, social media, is associated with risky sexual behavior, greater tolerance for harassment, belief in rape myths, and objectification of women. So as one high school senior said to me, you know, I think music has some of the biggest impact on how guys treat girls. When you're driving around in the car with your friends and you're hearing fuck that bitch and leave her five, six, ten times a day, it makes it hard to escape having that mindset. And that promise that in both mainstream media and porn of hot sex with a cold heart is what drives college and increasingly high school hookup cultures. So I want to take a minute here to define terms. Um, hookup. Completely meaningless word. It's intentionally ambiguous. It could mean kissing, it could mean groping, it could mean oral sex, it could mean group sex. You have no idea what somebody means when they say, I hooked up with somebody. And that allows young people to overestimate what their peers are up to. And that can lead to pressure um, to feel like you have to engage in unwanted sex or that um, you can become more coercive yourself. Um, in fact, uh, only in college campuses, um, 30 to 40 percent of hookups include intercourse. Maybe 15 percent include um, oral sex, and the rest are kissing and groping. What's more, a full 25 percent of kids on college campuses never hook up. 10 to 15 percent do hook up 10 times or more, engaging in some combination of those activities. And for the rest, the average number of partners is seven. So not exactly the fall of Rome. What's more? I think many of you in this room can attest to the fact that this generation did not invent casual sex. <laughs> so what's new here is not the notion of the hookup. What's new is the idea of hookup culture, which over 90% of students say dominates on their campus. And hookup culture is the idea that physical intimacy should precede emotional intimacy rather than be its product. So sex first, dating at the end of the line. And rather than casual sex being the exception, hookup culture makes it the normalized path to a relationship, even though most hookups won't lead to a relationship. Because one of the hallmarks, the reason is that one of the hallmarks of, ho of hookup culture is um, this resistance to catching feelings, which was another phrase that obsessed me. Catching feelings, like it's a disease, right? Like you, d you catch chlamydia, you catch gonorrhea, you catch feelings, you don't want that to happen. So in order to avoid catching chlamydia and gonorrhea, you have to put on a physical condom, right? In order to avoid catching feelings, you need your emotional condom. And what is that emotional condom made of? Alcohol. Hookup culture is not just lubricated by alcohol. It is dependent on it. To create what Lisa Wade, who wrote this fantastic book called American Hookup, calls the compulsory carelessness that's necessary for a hookup. Alcohol is what establishes meaninglessness. Hooking up sober would be meaningful. So it anesthetizes you against awkwardness and feelings, reduces accountability, even establishes the reason for a hookup. Not I was attracted to the person or I liked the person, but I was so drunk that that's what I did. Now, guys today were acutely aware that sex with an intoxicated person is assault. So the trick became to find someone and be drunk and be yourself who was drunk enough to say uh, yes, but not so drunk that they wouldn't be able to consent. 
And really, who is to be the judge of that? We talk a lot about how alcohol affects girls, but we have talked a lot less about the impact of alcohol on boys in those situations. Alcohol reduces boys' ability to hear no or to recognize a partner's hesitation. It gives them the courage they might not otherwise have to push in ways that they might not if they were sober. It makes them less likely to step in as bystanders. And since the vast majority of sexual misconduct cases on campus do involve alcohol, it's crucial that we talk to boys about the risks that they take when they binge drink and how those beer goggles can distort their perspective on consent. The truth is that when boys are drunk, they tend to vastly overperceive yes. In fact, um, Nicole Badera, who's a researcher at University of Michigan, has found that um, they pretty much can see any friendliness on the part of a girl at all as meaning that it's on. One thing that interested me, actually, when she told me that was that boys will often say, well, I'm not a mind reader, you know, she didn't say no. But apparently, they're pretty darn clairvoyant where yes is concerned. <laughs> boys are also prone to seeing one act, consent to one act, as um, consent to everything. So kissing on the dance floor is meaning consent to intercourse. And they're prone to believing that the place where something happens constitutes consent. So if you go back to somebody's dorm room, that means consent, except that it doesn't. And all of that contributes to boys believing sometimes, even when it's not true, that accusations of misconduct against them are unwarranted because male socialization teaches them too often to filter female behavior through the lens of their own desire. And even when boys understand consent, that understanding can be a little bit elastic. Badera asked her um, subjects to define consent, and all of them could, and then she asked them to describe um, their latest experience in a hookup and in a relationship. And when their actions in those situations did not meet their definition of consent, rather than examining their actions, they just um, expanded their definitions. And I think that that's partly because of how we learn to think about assault. We tend to think that only anyone who engages in misconduct is a monster, and only monsters engage in misconduct. So, if you cross those lines, you couldn't possibly still be a good guy. So you have to, whatever mental gymnastics are required, you have to engage in, in order to keep that good guy image. But that blinds us to the reality that, you know, sometimes a good guy can do a really bad thing. And the dynamics that I've described often get in the way of recognizing that and of being able to take the personal accountability that you need to take. But even beyond the legal, boys, like girls, often describe the sex in hookups as being pretty mediocre. I mean, if you're wasted and you don't know somebody very well, how good's it gonna be? So as one boy said to me, it's like you're having two very distinct experiences. There's not a lot of eye contact, there's not a lot of conversation. It's like you're acting vulnerable without being vulnerable with somebody that you don't know very well and don't care about. And it's kind of odd and not really very fun. So over the course of the many years that I've been talking to teenagers and interviewing teenagers about sex, I have met both guys and girls who are really into the hookup scene, um, who like that sense of competition and accomplishment and the buzz they get when they snag somebody they consider to be hot. But most kids, both the ones I talk to and in the overarching research, are ambivalent at best about hookup culture and often pretty unhappy with it. Guys didn't talk with the same level of betrayal or anger as the girls I interviewed, but they didn't really feel well served by that culture either. And my job as a journalist is not to tell young people the context in which they ought to be sexual. What I did want to do though was demythologize the hookup culture and help them through the voices of their peers understand what they were and were probably not likely to get from that culture. So for girls I would say you were likely to get, you know, a warm body, an adrenaline rush, a war story to tell your friends, but you were a lot less likely to get good sex or the tools you would need to create a good sexual experience or emotional connection. 
And with boys, I would really say the same thing, except I would add one more beat, which is that hookup culture also denies guys' capacity for love. And when I would talk to boys about love, they tended to act like their desire for it was a personal quirk and something that wasn't shared by their peers. But so many of them said that. And I thought a lot about it when I was writing the story of two boys in particular, Wyatt and Nate. Um, Wyatt, when we met, referred to himself as a, um, a feminist f boy. And yeah, and what he meant by that <laughs> was that he was super conscious about consent. He ran consent workshops on his campus. Um, but he was also not above taking advantage of the skewed ratio of girls to boys on that campus, which advantaged guys and allowed them to call the shots in social life. He, can, he was often manipulative, even though he was straightforward about the fact that he was being manipulative. And he treated his partners as disposable. And when we met, he was kind of reckoning with that. And we talked over the course of a couple years. And one day we were chatting on Skype, and another boy named Nate texted me. Nate was a high school senior who was now out looking at colleges where he'd been admitted. And he was somebody who really valued connection and intimacy in his personal relationships. And he texted me, um, what he wrote was, WTF is, up with, uh, WTF is with hookup culture. It's like an orgy here. Am I supposed to just go to bone town and worry about, in case you were wondering how they talk to me, um, <laughs> and worry about the emotional connection later? Or do I just forget about that part? So I read this text to Wyatt, and I asked his advice. And the two of them ended up having this whole conversation through me about personal authenticity and resisting the obvious script and the expectations on you as a guy and how you feel about them. And then, next, and then Nate texted me, thank you, that was just what I need to hear. And then he sent me a heart emoji. And, uh, <laughs> and I sat there thinking, I am a total stranger to this boy, really. And the two of them are never going to meet. And this conversation really only happened because of the um, coincidence of both of them being interviewed um, for a book. But what would it mean if the adults that were really in their lives could help them have this conversation? What would it mean if guys could have these conversations with one another? I also want to point out that um, the gay guys that I talked to were a real model for straight people in terms of negotiating consent and the parameters of a sexual relationship. Um, which is not to say they didn't have issues with communication or assault or um, uh, that they didn't have, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I just was looking, sorry, my, my light just went out and I went a little phooey there. Um, but they had really learned how to set the terms of um, behavior because who was going to do what to whom and how and with whom could never be assumed. So one gay guy said to me, I don't know, uh, I, I don't really get the resistance that straight guys have about consent because like, when we talk about that, that means it's on and like, we're gonna have sex and that's great. Dan Savage, your local guy, um, sa talks about the four magic words that gay men use um, at the start of a sexual encounter, which are, what are you into? And I loved that question because it was so open-ended and so often when we talk to heterosexual kids, we talk about a set of prescribed questions that a guy is asking a girl to which she can say yes or no. That said, Dan is a gay man and he has sex with other men, obviously. Um, and I fear that if a heterosexual boy asked that question to a girl, the response might well be, I have no earthly idea. And that was what girls and sex was about. So it kind of reveals the kind of symbiosis of socialization that can undermine communication um, between partners. But I really started thinking, you know, what if we could get to the point where young people could actually ask and answer that question in an open-hearted way and create an experience that worked for them? Guys of color, too, related to these issues of sex, masculinity, and intimacy, and consent differently than white guys. The boys of color I spoke with were a specific group. Um, they were uh, um, in the same demographic as the other boys, so they were in largely white educational institutions, though back home that was not um, often not the case. And I was really interested in how masculinity and sexuality um, worked for African-American and Asian-American boys in particular because they felt like flip sides of a coin where white masculinity was controlling the toss. White masculinity was seen as kind of the neutral. 
and with black boys, um, a kind of hypersexuality was then projected onto them. And that, um, on one hand, allowed them to be seen as the coolest dude in the room, but on the other hand, could turn them into being seen very quickly as um, sexually predatory. And they carried that anxiety with them all the time. So one of the African-American guys that I talked to said, you know, I'm not gonna go party with a bunch of drunk white kids because anything could happen. And if I'm the only black guy in the room, I'm the only black guy in the room. Meanwhile, Asian guys had projected onto them um, asexuality and, emascul and um, uh, emasculation. And, um, and that caused its own psychological stress. So uh, one of the Asian guys I talked to said to me, um, he had been matched with a girl on Tinder and they were going back and forth and she said, you know, uh, we could be friends, but no offense, I don't date Asian guys. And he turned to me and went, how is that no offense? <laughs> you know? And what interested me about all that was that today's teens are so conscious and conscientious about racism, but, um, but the white teens tended to be much less aware of how their ideas about gender and sex were filtered through race, and they tended to leave that, their critique um, at the door when they entered their social interactions. So there's a lot of other things I talk about in this book. Um, I talk a lot about boys' experience of unwanted sex and violation themselves. Um, I talk about alternative ways to approach campus assault involving restorative practice rather than expulsion or suspension. But for now, I just want to talk a minute about moving forward as parents. I hope by now you've realized that it's not about the talk, right? I mean, if you think about table manners, if you sat down with your son and you said, okay, um, this is how you hold your, hold your fork, put your napkin on your lap, say please when you ask for things to be passed, say thank you, and make sure to say um, excuse me when you get up from the table and don't burp. Um, okay, go forth and be polite. We're never gonna have this conversation again. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. Sex and intimacy are at least as important as table manners. <laughs> Aren't they? So. It's not about having this big talk. It's about a lot of small conversations throughout boys' lives that are about sex, but not just about sex, that are about consent, but aren't just about consent, that are about emotional connection and disconnection, that are about media, that are about making gender dynamics visible to them, that are about personal accountability. Boys, by the way, were clear to me that they wanted to hear more from the men in their lives on these subjects, whether it was fathers or uncles or stepfathers, whomever the male role model was in their lives. And they wanted to hear about sex, they wanted to hear about emotional intimacy, and they wanted to hear about the regrets that men in their lives had. And I know that for men, it's hard to know how to do that. I know it's not the way you were raised. And I would just say that you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to know all the answers. You don't even have to know all the questions. And you certainly don't need to have been perfect in your own relationship life or have the ideal relationship now. You just have to start somewhere. You just have to start somewhere. And coaches also can play a tremendous role in boys' lives. Coaching Boys Into Men, um, for instance, is a great program, a series of light weekly interventions that have been proven to reduce sexual and dating violence, increase bystander intervention, and reduced misogynist language in high school boys. And just last week, they put out a report that it's even more effective with middle school boys. So these all-male enclaves, like sports and frats, they can be a smokescreen for the worst kind of bro culture. But I think and hope that they can also be leveraged as a crucible of change. As I said at the beginning of this, the Me Too movement has sparked much needed reckoning, and it has also provided parents of boys and boys themselves a real opportunity and real motivation to transform the rules of male psychological development and sexuality. And that's not an easy task, but it is a truly exciting one the opportunity to raise boys to be empathic and egalitarian, respectful of others' boundaries, capable of connection, mutuality, honest communication, appropriate emotional expression and love, 
to be able to help them develop and sustain authentic relationships, to be happier and more fulfilled, more able to see women as true peers, both in the public and in private life, to raise our boys to be their best selves and to be the men that we know they can become. Thank you. What are some insights regarding any overarching internal narratives uh, with young men and women? I'm not sure I understand. Can you be a little, can you, I'm not sure what you mean Template by that. Template that they approach their psychosocial relationships, or seeking of approval, or... Uh, well, I think, I mean, I think that's, that's sort of what I was trying to describe with boys, but like I said at the beginning, I felt that, that with girls, the big kind of core issue of the book was looking at the ways that they um, had been disconnected from body and from pleasure and looking at these issues of um, what I call, what, what I don't call, what Sarah McClellan, who's at Mich University of Michigan, um, a psychologist, has called intimate justice. Um, which is looking at the ways that, um, who's the primary beneficiary of the sex, sexual experience, who, um, uh, how do both partners define good enough, what the politics are inside of an experience, inside of a personal life, much the way that you would look at the politics of like, who scrubs the floor in your house or who washes the dishes. Um, and that I believe that sex can bring up um, all those issues of inequality, of, um, of personal well-being, of violence. Um, and what I wanted when I was writing the girl book, what I kept thinking about was how tricky it was to answer these questions and how much I wanted girl sexual experience not to be something that they had to get over. Um, so I feel that that was kind of an overarching theme in looking at the girl's book. And with the boy's book, I think a lot of it was um, really looking at these ideas about connection and disconnection and how boys were struggling with them. And I think one of the things that was really exciting, like I said, was that guys were. And so a lot of the things, even when we were talking about sexual misconduct that they talked about um, and wrestled with, because I actually almost called this book, I know I'm a good guy, but dot, dot, dot. Um, my publisher wasn't having it. But because they so often said that, um, but uh, what was the the positive aspect of that was that they had um, were wrestling with things that I think five or ten years ago guys would not even be questioning. You know that there was a new question about how they were supposed to engage, how they wanted to engage, how they could engage, and I think that we're at this inflection point with boys that maybe where we were at with girls 25 years ago, um, where it's time to sort of make a change and look at their lives and think about how we can better guide them. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what I got. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thank you so much for coming and speaking tonight and all this amazing work. Um, so I snuck in. I don't have sons. I have two daughters. And that's I think okay. my big question, but I do work with, uh -huh. with teenagers, including boys. So I'll take what I can. But my big question is, after all this research that you've done, what chapter would you add to your girl book? Ooh. <laughs> That's such a good question. I don't have an answer for that. Um, you know what I would do? Here's, here's what, I, the, what just pops into my head, is that there's a, there is a section in um, the boy book where, well, so I go to a, I go to a, um, a freshman in college, you know, college freshman pregame party, as one does, because um, <laughs> that's not at all awkward. Let me tell you, and and you know, I'm drinking. I'm not drinking. I'm not drinking. I'm not drinking. <laughs> They're drinking. I'm talking to them. I don't drink. And uh, and they go to their party, and then the next day we get together afterwards. And what was and it was the only interview I've really done that had both boys and girls in the room. Um, and we were talking about hookup culture and they got so into comparing and contrasting in a way that for some reason they never seemed to. And when we finished talking, um, they said, uh, can we do this again next week? And I said, yeah, yeah, go right ahead. I'm not gonna be here. Don't live in the dorm. But, um, but yeah, and so I guess it's not so much that I would add a chapter, but 
I almost feel like I wish I could like meld them and allow them to talk to one another more. And, and, and I feel like what this book does, what the boy book does is offer that balance so that they're, they're much more in conversation. And so I think that the whole book maybe is the chapter I would add if I were to add a chapter to the, to the girl book. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, Peggy. Hi. Uh, for your next book, would you consider taking on the broader uh, effects that American masculinity has <laughs> on its, um, on our society to include things like gun violence and the uh, odd state of our politics? <laughs> You know, when I said earlier, I don't know. When I said, I, I do think I, I need to move into adults now, though. Um, that's, that I do believe. But when I said earlier that, um, that, that I don't like to say toxic masculinity where I'm moving away from that. There's a phrase that I learned, precarious masculinity, which I think is better, less demonizing. But that those, those um, man box values, when men cling to them, I said that they can offer rewards. Sometimes they can get you all the way to the presidency. They really can, right? And you absolutely can wreak havoc in the lives of everybody else in the world um, along the way. Um, and, and yeah, when I was thinking about things like uh, when I was telling the story about Rob earlier, um, who ended up confiding in his mom, I could see a scenario where that guy, feeling more and more isolated, more and more angry, unable to talk to anybody, unable to express feelings, ashamed of his feelings, angry about his feelings, could turn to violence in some kind, in some way. So I think that those, the seeds of those ideas, you definitely can see in this book. Um, but I thank you for that suggestion, and you know, I'll, 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 I'll think about it. <laughs> Hi, Peggy. So one question is, um, knowing that our young people spend so much of their time in school, and there's maybe some educators in the room, uh, and often, you know, coaches have a lot of influence on socialization, et cetera. What would you ask of your schools, of your principals, of uh, people going through teacher education? What would you want them to know, and then what would you want them to do? And you mentioned coaching boys into men, but coaching what would be your wishes for the education system? Well, you know, I mean... <sighs> yeah. If I could wave my magic wand, I'd have excellent you know, human development classes in schools from the get-go, from kindergarten onward. Um, but we live in a country, I mean, we have this weird bifurcation where on one hand, we let our kids be completely saturated in this highly sexualized, commodified media. On the other hand, we don't want to, you know, compromise their innocence by talking to them about what constitutes a healthy sexual relationship. It is a form of insanity. Um, and we have in the, you know, we still, abstinence only is, you know, in some places it's day is done, things are turning, but it's still the norm in um, 29 states. And that is just putting, you know, ideology over public health over and over again. Um, not that there's anything wrong with being abstinent, you know, that's a fine choice, but we don't, it shouldn't be a mandate, and we shouldn't be comparing sexually active teenagers to chewed pieces of gum. Um, so, you know, I know all of you know that, but the question is how to get that into our schools in a way that is integrated and healthy, uh, integrated and, comp and comprehensive, and that doesn't just focus on risk and danger. That's the other piece, because I'll tell you, I mean, and I talk about this more in the girl book, but the, the country that does it right, it's always the Scandinavians. I know it's always the Scandinavians. <laughs> but the country that really does it right is Holland. And there is research that compares, um, this is really about girls, but I think there, there's also research on boys, that compares the early sexual experiences of demographically similar college girls in Holland and the United States. And right down the line, the... Um, the Dutch girls have everything we say we want. You know, they have fewer negative consequences like disease or, or pregnancy. They're more likely to have prepared responsibly for their experiences. They um, are more likely to um, have uh, know their partner very well, communicate, be sober, all the things that we enjoy themselves, all these things that we say we want, we don't have them, they have them. Why? Because when they talk to the kids more, they said that they're um, parents, their teachers, and their doctors talk to them from a very early age, often about sex, about pleasure, and about the importance of mutually trusting relationships. And it, was, and it wasn't that American parents didn't talk to their children necessarily, but again, they framed things in terms of risk and danger just about exclusively. 
and the Dutch parents talked about responsibility and joy. And so I guess, you know, as a parent myself, when I first looked at that, inter that um, research, it just hit me between the eyes because I thought, I totally would have done that. I would have talked to my child about disease protection and contraception, and because I'm modern, I would have talked about consent, and I would have thought I was done. And now I know that's not true. And so I have sat in classes, like there's uh, Shafia Zaloum in, in San Francisco who wrote a book called Sex, Teens, and Everything in Between, which I highly recommend, has great discussion prompts for parents for talking about your kids, talking with your kids. Um, but she, you know, I've, I've sat in classes like hers that are outstanding. And you can see the potential for change and, and better interactions through those. So I guess if I was to say something to schools, it would be like, you need to get noisier about insisting that we can't put ideology over public health and that we need to be talking to our kids very clearly about all of these issues. Go for it, dude. All right. Um, so thank you. Yeah, my question is kind of about the idea that you've, one of the themes that I think you've brought up about how men and women or boys and girls have such radically different menus of available emotions and behaviors and preferences that they can just express okay. regarding yeah. sexuality, that mm -hmm. there's almost no overlap. And, you know, if our goal is to bring these two menus closer together, to enlighten men so that they can express anxiety and love and allow women to express sexual pleasure or explore that more, how much is the final goal, the ideal goal, giving people the same full, unrestricted menus of options? And how much do you think these differences might exist for reasons and some differences are inevitable? Well, what we, you're asking kind of a nature-nurture question, which of course I don't have a control group to give you, except the Dutch. <laughs> they have it all. Um, their boys also express, you know, the, there's, a, there's work by Amy Shallot, who's at the University of Massachusetts, about how Dutch boys talk very differently about um, relationships and connection than American boys. Um, and again, she also found that American boys tend to talk about love like it's a personal quirk. And Dutch boys will say things like, well, of course you would want to be in love with your partner that you're having sex with. And you would never have, I like this phrase, she said, you would never have sex with a drunk head. That, that's what the boys say. Um, so I think so much of this is learned. I mean, there's no evidence that boys have less capacity for empathy when they're born. Um, that's for sure. Um, and there's no evidence that girls are not um, able to connect with their sexual pleasure. So I think that we could broaden both of those arenas tremendously before we even started having that conversation. And the truth is, um, nurture becomes nature. You know, they're not necessarily independent of one another. We, there's lots of evidence that what we practice is who we become. So when we are, you know, the myelination of your neuron, of your brain and all that kind of stuff when you're a teenager, what you do over and over, the other things drop away and those things strengthen. So I think we're doing a lot of strengthening of very particular kinds of things with boys and very particular kinds of things with girls. And that if we broaden that, I don't know where we'll end up, but everybody's going to have a broader capacity for all of this. Thanks. So, sure. So should we... we... Have time for one more question. Okay. Hi, Peggy. Thank you so Hi. much. Um, I'm just wondering if you could give the young folks in this room, uh, the boys in particular, just like one tool to walk away with to uh, bring into their peer groups. Because from my experience, and I think a lot of people can relate, that a lot of things come from within the peer group right. and how they learn. And so it seems like to change the culture, it needs to be an inside job. Yeah. And so how do you give that knowledge to them with tools that are readily accessible to them and sort of take it out of the context in this room so that they can walk into their friendships with that? Well, I, I think um, thinking about how you can take small, small acts of courage towards talking to your male peers and towards bringing up some of these issues and connecting. Um, I don't know that there's one big takeaway, but what I was hoping with this book, um, more than I guess anything I can, I can just say off the top of my head, was, th was that it would do two things. One was that it would be a tool for parents to better understand what was going on with boys and to maybe help generate some discussion. Um, but the other was that I really wanted boys themselves to read it. And I hope that in doing so, 
that they could maybe get beyond the guy talk and maybe use it as a tool to have kind of, you know, develop deeper dialogue with guys that you trust who are like-minded. If you're in this room, I assume that you already have kind of a desire to um, have a different way of being. Um, and start creating that kind of community and start that meaningful dialogue with other guys and, and maybe with your own help, help and within your own head. So I guess that's, that's what I got, is that I hope um, either by reading the book or by you know, being with some guys and like reading, the, reading the Atlantic excerpt and talking about it or listening to one of the podcasts I've done and talking about it or watching the Good Morning America piece, that maybe it can be a conversation starter um, for groups of boys themselves to start tackling some of these issues. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> Thank you.